You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis, your host for BioTalk. And we have a double treat for you today. We're almost approaching 100 BioTalks, and I thought this one is almost one of the more unusual ones we've done because it's a topic we've never had in our podcast before. We're going to talk a little bit about AI, machine learning, supercomputing, advanced computing, quantum computing, how it relates to the biohealth industry. And we have two experts that we've been able to attract to the podcast today to discuss this. Our first expert is Dr. Javier Barril, who is the Chief Scientific Officer, Gain Therapeutics, and also at the University of Barcelona as an ICREA professor, I-C-R-E-A professor, and we'll learn more about what that actually means with Javier later. And also on this podcast, for the first time, we have someone from Wall Street and going to have someone talk about what the impact of this information and data age is on the pharma and the bio industry. And we have Hartaj Singh, which I'm going to refer to as Taj in this podcast. And he's an equity research analyst with Oppenheimer and Company. Javier and Taj, welcome to Biotalk. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. You're welcome. And we have a lot to cover. So let's get started. And the best way for the listeners to understand a little bit about both of you personally is I'm going to let each of you do a personal introduction about yourself, a little bit about your background, sort of your education, how you evolved into what you're doing today, why you made the decision to do what you're doing today. So why don't we start with Dr. Barrill? Thank you. So, yeah, I, I studied chemistry, biochemistry here in Barcelona, in Spain. And then I went for my PhD and I was attracted to computation from the beginning. I was actually hesitating about doing informatics or chemistry when to choose my bachelor. And actually the two things come together very naturally for me. It was a very good experience during the PhD to actually use computers to solve chemistry problems and problems related to life sciences, seeing proteins in 3D. All this was really, really exciting. For me, it was a bit missing at that point was actually the application of those methods. I was so excited about those methods. They were so fantastic. I really wanted to experience how to use them in real life. And at that point, then I moved to the UK, to Cambridge area. I was working for a company. It was called Vernalis. It still exists. And that was a really fantastic experience in terms of the application of the methods. So we, for instance, discovered HSP-19 inhibitors that then were licensed to no parties and they reached phase two clinical trials. Unfortunately, they didn't go farther than that. That's one of the frustrations, I guess, in my career, but I guess I cannot complain also when I look at other colleagues. Then also the other thing was really, really terrific was working alongside experimental people, building methods together. At the time, we were also developing fragment-based drug discovery and working with people in NMR, crystallography, all this. I really enjoyed that atmosphere and the collaboration. And then a little bit paradoxically, I was actually frustrated then with the computational methods because they didn't deliver as much as I expected. They did deliver, but not to the level that I wanted, right? And that's actually what gave me the motivation to, after five years in industry, go back to academia, which is not the most common of moves, but it's also not not unheard of. So I came back to Barcelona. I created my own research group, and my motivation was to develop uh, better computational methods for real problems in drug discovery. And that's what I've been trying to do since 2005. And this went quite well, I think. We actually, one of the technologies we created was used to create a spin-off which eventually became Game Therapeutics, where now I am Chief Scientific Officer. And I'm now doing both things. I'm an academic, a career researcher at the University of Barcelona, and also the CSO of Game Therapeutics. And it's really, for me personally, I mean, of course, it's it's hard, but it's uh, personally, it's very fulfilling 
because you get to have an application in real life to try to discover new drugs that can have a, an impact on patients. And at the same time, you have also to think about how to make things better, how to keep up with all the developments that happen in science. So personally, for me, it's a good choice, but I don't think I can recommend that to anyone. Well, thank you for that intro. And I forgot to tell the listeners, this really is an international podcast because Dr. Barilla is broadcasting from Barcelona, Spain. And then Taj Singh, who we're going to introduce next, is in Research Triangle in North Carolina. So basically, we have a European-American biotalk today. And the other thing I'm going to follow up with with Dr. Burrell is a little bit about this balance between academia and industry, because it's an unusual balance of being able to do both at the same time. I'll come back and ask you about that later. But I think now let's have the listeners get a little background information on Taj Singh with Oppenheimer. Taj? Great, Rich. Javier, thank you so very much. First of all, I just want to thank you for having me. You know, being a Wall Street analyst, it is really a pleasure to be on panels where people are moving the needle in the real economy, you know, and and by doing so, creating great jobs and also helping patients and moving science along. So it really is a pleasure. You know, why I'm here, honestly, is basically just a tribute to serendipity. I probably have one of the least planned careers of anybody you'll ever meet. I went to college in the late 80s, early 90s, almost finished a master's in neurobiology. And then after that, worked in clinical drug development. I just got a job in it fairly randomly in Research Triangle Park and was just fascinated with it. Biology has always been a core area of interest of mine, has been a guiding light in my career. And I was lucky enough to really help with bringing some drugs to the clinic. I worked for six years for a clinical research organization, CRO, called Clin Trials Research. That essentially, experience helped me get to business school here in the RTP area at Duke University, where I realized I didn't have enough of the background in finance and accounting. That actually started my journey to Wall Street because I say this a little, in almost a little embarrassed. I fell in love with finance. I started thinking about stocks and you know what makes a stock move basically in business school. And that led me to a career in finance, which started in 2005. So about three years after I graduated from business school with Lehman Brothers in their San Francisco office in biotech. It was a great introduction. I had a fantastic first analyst I worked for, a very fundamental analyst, and been on Wall Street ever since. I've been on the sell side and the buy side since 2005 and been with Oppenheimer for six years now as one of the biotechnology analysts there. But again, most of my career progression has been really not really planned. It has just occurred at a time in my life where I felt that you know I needed that next step. And here I am, you know, now talking about supercomputers and how potentially a really important advances in data computing and data analysis that, for example, Dr. Burrell and his group are working with could help biotechnology and how Wall Street views that. Well, thank you very much, Hardija. It is serendipity. And basically, I might have a more curious route to where I got to than you did with many more steps, but yours is a little more clear path. And it's great to have you here because there aren't that many people focused on Wall Street in this area of research that you have decided is going to be very important to the future of healthcare and industry in the future. So we're going to dive a little deeper into that because Gain Therapeutics is one of the companies you're following, which is a public company, but a lot of people don't know what Gain Therapeutics does. And we're going to turn to Javier to talk about Gain. Give us an introduction to the company, Javier. For us, a part of our DNA is that we are extremely efficient. We have to be. And computational technologies actually are really, really good for that. Computation alone, I will argue, it's not useful for life sciences. But a wise mix of computation and experiments can be very, very efficient. And that's what we have been trying to do. So we started with a computational method that we developed in our lab. Essentially, you run molecular simulations in a supercomputer. And that is charting, giving you a map, a clear map of a protein surface. So first, you you need to have the three-dimensional structure of a protein. And with these molecular dynamic simulations and then special analysis methods, what you get is like a complete map of what the protein likes to do in terms of interacting with other molecules. And of course, the drug is just an organic molecule that really feels an attraction for a particular place 
on the surface of the protein. And then without that map, we're a bit lost uh, because proteins are really beautiful sometimes, but very hard to interpret structures. This map actually tells us this particular point on the surface of the protein really would like to interact with this type of atom. This other part would like to interact with those other atom type. And then we can design molecules that complement the protein in that way. Of course, this is what the computer does, but then we have to actually also select molecules that can do that with another method. And then finally, we come to the experiment and we have to test those molecules and see that they indeed bind. And then more importantly, that they do the biological function that they are supposed to do. And that's where the balance between computation and experiment is so important because to make our lives a little bit more complicated, our goal was not to discover molecules that would bind to proteins and stop them from working. We wanted to have gain of function. That's where the name of the company comes from. We want to take a protein that is has a mutation and it's not working properly. That's what happens in rare diseases. And then with our molecule, then the protein has to be more functional. The mutations usually cause the protein from cause the protein misfolding. So what we're trying to do is to help the protein stay folded. And that without interfering with the natural function of the protein. And this is just not possible to compute. We can compute if a molecule can bind, where it can bind and so on, but we cannot predict what's going to happen in such a complex biological environment. So then the computational methods open an opportunity to find a molecule that's something that could be almost impossible to do experimentally. So we're really proud of being maybe the first company that's doing rational allosteric drug discovery. But we're also very humble in the sense that we know that you know the molecule may bind there, but it may, for instance, interact with another protein or compete with another protein, and then it may not have a biological readout. So we have to have this dialogue with experiments. And the other thing that we also have to be very aware of is that we we create the opportunity. We have the initial molecules, but then you have to do traditional, old-fashioned medicinal chemistry. And, you know, it's a very, very hard work. We have to optimize the molecules and take them to the level where they can actually go into human clinical trials. And that's also not the straightforward, so anybody can tell you. Thank you for that introduction. And basically, you're talking a little bit about the computational analysis that's done, but there are also the need for the human interaction. The computer cannot do everything. And then one thing before we go to Taj a little bit, you know, you have a unique structure because I understand, I think the supercomputer you're using is in Barcelona, but there's another one also in Switzerland that is part of your network. Can you explain that? Because the other thing that's interesting for our listeners in the biohealth capital region, which is Maryland, D.C. and Virginia, is that the U.S. headquarters for gain therapeutics now is in Bethesda, Maryland, with Eric Richmond, who's a serial entrepreneur that we've known very well in that area. And so talk a little bit about the dynamics of Spain, Switzerland, and Maryland, and sort of your introduction to Eric there. Yeah, maybe I'll tell a little bit about the history of the company. So when we created the spin-off, actually it was a different company, it was, uh, it was called Minorix. And this company also exists, but we created it with two different business objectives. One was more repositioning for diseases, and the other was actually discovering new chemical matter and this is what we do with the technology. Eventually, the repositioning business and what we were doing were separating in the phase that we were, and the investors decided they preferred the single asset company. So actually, Gain was created somehow like the spin-off of the spin-off company. And then we had Swiss investors interested in the technology. And then we have our colleagues in Lugano, in the Italian corner of Switzerland. We work with them now very well. We have the most of the research is here. Development is there. Management is there and in the US now. And I don't know, I feel that, of course, at the beginning, you have to get to know each other, but that was fairly natural. And we worked together very well in spite of the pandemic, or maybe because of the pandemic, we we're just all day talking to each other on Zoom or whatever. 
And then we access resources wherever we can access them. So in the beginning, we were using the local supercomputer, but now we're using more the Swiss center, which has, I mean, both are very good. So I'm not going to compare them, but for us, it was easier to get access there. And they have very good hardware also in terms of the architecture, the GPUs that they have for the, we need for the, uh, super, the computation, which are not CPU based. They are GPU based. You know, there are these graphical cards that are specific for computation and they have lots of them in the last generation and they are going to improve them as well, have a new generation very soon. So yeah, we're really happy about that alliance with them. Yeah, what's very interesting is basically you're functioning today and right from the beginning, the way the rest of the world has been forced to function. You basically are interacting with people in Spain, Switzerland, and in the United States, but that was by design and showing how efficiently you can operate with that distance separation with the technology that's available today to really enable gain therapeutics to continue to grow and go forward in spite of the pandemic, which probably hasn't impacted you dramatically because you've been working virtually right from the beginning. So yeah, we'll pick up a little bit more of that, but let's go back to our Wall Street analyst here, Taj. You've heard and you've been following GAIN. First of all, let's talk a little bit about why you got interested in advanced computing and its relation to the pharma and the bio industry, and then what attracted you to GAIN Therapeutics as a company you might want to follow? Yeah. So Rich, you know, in terms of our initial interest, you know, a lot of our interest in companies like GAIN is actually derived from some of the success we've had covering companies like Moderna. You know, Moderna has been viewed now as a platform technology. mRNA is unique. It's very scalable. And, you know, it can get to disease targets, you know, as they're called, meaning targets that make a disease what it is, or if you can influence that target, you can somehow influence the disease, hopefully in a positive way. And with mRNA, you can get to certain targets that you could not with, you know, small molecules, antibodies, et cetera. So that influence was combined with just, a, you know, ever since I did some work in competition neurobiology in the 1990s in grad school, I was always interested in what's called the in silico. There's in vitro in a petri dish, you know, in vivo inside living organisms, and then in silico inside a computer, right, approach to drug development. The interest there has waxed and waned, you know, and, and it's mostly been focused on patient data, actually, which is, you could really argue, is not really drug development. But, you know, those two areas came together when I first started, I was introduced to game therapeutics because it led to a couple of, you know, I would call them aha moments for me. One was that, you know, Gaines' approach, as Javier has described, you know, far better than I can, of sort of combining computing power with understanding proteins at three-dimensional structures and then identifying areas of proteins that they can influence sort of a gain of function, so to speak. You know, and this could help in disorders where proteins misfold or not correctly folded or et cetera, at least initially was fascinating to me. I, you know, that's been an area that people have tried to tackle over the last couple of decades, have not had a lot of success, and GAIN could be bringing a new you know, paradigm, new approach with their computational approach focused on allosteric sites, you know, away from the catalytic sites, so to speak. And then secondly, you know, was this in silico approach, right? So the platform approach that Moderna has demonstrated to us you know, increasingly, we look for companies that are not just what I call one-hit wonders in biotech. There's nothing wrong with being a one-hit wonder. If you have a drug that can help, you know, hundreds or thousands of millions of people, fantastic, more power to you and to your investors, your management team. But it's also nice if a company has a platform technology that can be, you know, scaled and used efficiently to go after different diseases once they've gone after the first disease. And that's the other aspect of what we like about GAIN, which is that their approach can not just help with one protein, for example, in the beginning, but as they hopefully achieve success initially, they can start going after different diseases with a similar approach. And that platform approach actually has more value, broadly speaking, than just a one-hit wonder sort of approach that has been the purview of biotechnology over the last 20 years. Thank you, Taj. And you're talking about many different approaches and many diseases, and we really haven't really focused Javier, on where the focus for gain is in which disease indices at this particular point in time. So talk a little bit about where your focus is today and where you see other opportunities for the future. 
Yeah, that, that's very really important. So we have actually created a portfolio of projects. We have they are, and they all the projects that we have at the moment are on the rare disease space. With the pipeline includes GLB one. GBA, which actually has two phases. One is for Parkinson disease. The other is for a rare disease called Gaucher. And then we have another project on Idua and also Galaxy or Krabi. So we have four different proteins, which actually turns into five different projects. And that actually also means, relating to what Tash is saying, is that we have validated the platform. Of course, each project on its own has its value, but we have managed to validate that we can with very efficiently discover allosteric molecules that have a biological effect. And that's not mm, trivial. And that places us in a position where we can now scale and we can apply the same technology to other proteins and not necessarily in the gain of function field, which is of course, very interesting, but also in other aspects, proteins that don't have a binding site, functional binding site, because their function is not, for instance, the catalysis of something. They are not enzymes. They may be involved in protein-protein interactions, and they may have allosteric binding site. And this creates new opportunities. Also, new targets are appearing all the time, but also old targets, if you target them in the allosteric side, the mechanism that you, this different mechanism of action, this is a different response. And this may translate into different therapeutic opportunities. So we're really looking forward to focusing primarily on the allosteric space to collaborate with other companies and to expand our portfolio, not in the rare disease only, but beyond that. So basically with your technological focus, it takes a lot of money just to advance one. You've got potentially five in the pipeline right now, and you're talking about more. So is your goal with Gain Therapeutics to be a totally vertically integrated therapeutic company, or as you mentioned, collaborate with other strategics in those areas where they might be strong for you to grow so you can go down parallel paths because you can't be all things to all people? I mean, the latter is exactly what we want to do is we're really good at the very early stage in creating these new opportunities. And then there's a lot of hard work on the biology side, because, you know, you cannot be an expert as a company like ours. You cannot have experts on all disease areas. And of course, the muscle that you need in terms of medicinal chemistry, structural biology, and so on is also important. So you cannot have many different projects on your own, but the technology really is scalable and we would like to enter into more collaborations. We already have collaborations that are announced in the webpage, but we'd like to actually expand. Yeah, and as you're interacting, and this is for both of you, with your computational approach, how many of the big pharma and bio that you're interacting with are as sophisticated as you are? Or are they basically looking at you as sort of a pioneer to help educate them in what they could be doing with their research in the future? So. You know, I'd like to go to both Taj and Javier on that. So I think in science, you have to be also very humble. And I see that there are companies also doing allosteric drug discovery. It's a very hot field. It's very important. And I'm not going to say anything bad about their technology. But what we can say is our technology has actually been tried and we have delivered. And I think that's what set us apart. I can also discuss the technical details, you know, why we think it works better and so on. But I think in the end, what matters is we have uh, created a number of examples and we can reproduce that again and again. So that's my take. That was a good, humble answer. And you haven't made any of your strategic partners mad with that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Taj, I that, yeah. yeah. Taj, what's your perspective there? So I completely understand, agree everything with Javier, you know, that he says, you know, the one thing I'd just like to point out is context, right? So preclinical drug discovery, you know, meaning before human beings, preclinic takes about three to eight years on average. I mean, those are the historical sort of numbers, you know, then once you get into the clinic, it takes you as little as three years and as much as seven to eight years to get hopefully approved, right? Now, what Javier was talking about, you know, and where Wall Street to us, this is very interesting to me also as an analyst, is the investments that have to be made. There's many people that have quoted 
you know, billion, $2 billion investments, et cetera, that have to be made. But to Javier's point, to your point, what we've noticed is that there's this sort of area where companies really struggle. It's not preclinically often because there you just need a few million dollars to tens of millions of dollars to develop those, right? And it's not in the phase two or phase three, meaning mid to late stage drug, because at that point, you've got a strategic who might come in with you if they think the, the opportunity is fascinating enough. It's that in-between space where you're just getting ready to go into the clinic and your early stage where there's a lot of risk. And that's where either VCs come in and now increasingly the public markets. You know, Gain probably 10 years ago and Javier can give his own perspective, you know, or, or Eric or others might have been, you know, also could have been funded by VCs. What we're seeing is more of these early stage companies coming to the public markets where essentially the public investors serve as analogous to angel investors, you know, taking on that early stage risk while they're going about, you know, getting data and hopefully also getting strategic investors. So that's the sort of paradigm that we're seeing shifting, you know, in the biotech space, which is constantly in the need of investment dollars. And, you know, really the bloom on this biotech rose right now is very bright. The question is, how long is it going to last, Taj? I mean, the number of IPOs, the amount of financings, the size of financings has just been unbelievable over the last couple of years. What's your projection as a Wall Street analyst on how long is this going to continue? And I think Javier would be very interested in this as well as they're looking for additional rounds of financing. Yeah, you know, absolutely, Rich. So, you know, just two little thoughts here. One is a thought experiment, right? But let's just say if we could somehow go back 100 years, you know, in time and space to 1921, right? If we were sitting here and we were discussing about this thing that maybe some people were working on called the computer, I don't know if it was called that then, right? But people already starting to believe in the idea that maybe a machine could help us with complex algorithmic problems, right? And if somebody told you that computers 100 years from now would be worth about 40% of the world's GDP, that industry. First of all, not only would you be shocked that such a thing could exist, but then it would create so much wealth and so many jobs, it would probably stun you, right? So in that context, let's think about where biotech is today. So the NBI, NASDAQ Biotechnology Index in the United States, is 205 companies. It's worth one, slightly over $1 trillion. Just to give you a frame of reference, you know, the NASDAQ Technology Index is worth about 17 or $18 trillion. So we're tiny compared to technology and other industries. So even though we've had a great IPO and secondary market, I do believe this will continue because I believe biotechnology is where the next generation of real alpha, real money-making opportunities are going to be. We're so tiny compared to technology and we're solving such fundamental problems in diseases, in healthy living, in longevity, quality of life, et cetera, that I believe the investment dollars will just continue to grow. I don't expect this. Now, there will be lumpiness you know, in those investment dollars when it comes, but I actually believe that you know, these 205 companies in the Nasdaq Biotechnology Index, one trillion going to ten trillion, right? In market cap ten years from now, is much more likely than sixteen trillion in the total Nasdaq Technology Index going to whatever one hundred sixty trillion, right? In ten years. So you've just given an investment tip to our listeners, right, Taj? I tell people that if they want to send their kids to college and their kids are being born today, they should be buying Biotechnology Index for the future <laughs> for their kids' education. And there might be another company on this podcast with us that might be a company to look at. So. I'll stop with the commercial right there. Javier, one of the challenges is you're in such an area that is new because of the terminology. People talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing, supercomputers, advanced computing, computational methods, all of this. I mean, how does the average Joe citizen, how can you dumb it down for them to basically summarize what differentiates gain therapeutics utilizing this technology, make it simple for us to understand. Wow. <laughs> I wish I could do that. <laughs> but I relate to what Taj was saying, but from a different perspective. When you look at science in general and science news, and, and then you compare to, I mean, the general news, they are so gloomy and depressing, right? With science news every day, it's like a holiday. This news every day about incredible developments, more data being made available, new algorithms, every day, it's just amazing. And in a way, I also feel like, like Tash, you know, that my favorite cartoon character is this famous book, that's treasure everywhere, Calvin. And I feel like that. It's a, an incredible moment in science where there's lots of opportunities. At the same time, 
you also have to be very aware of where we are. There's lots of opportunities because we're starting from the origin, right? And we're growing at a very fast pace and we are trying to catch up. For us, it's not easy to just stay aware of all the different methods, but each method comes with its own limitations. And you have to be an expert to actually understand that, right? Machine learning is amazing what these guys are doing, but machine learning cannot solve all the problems. And physics-based, what we do, compared to what I was doing during my PhD, it's outstanding. It's fantastic. But you have to be an expert to actually understand where you can use them, what's the problem that you can solve with that. And there's nothing worse than like this, you know, a guy with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. In drug discovery, you cannot do that. You have to be aware of all the different tools that are out there and understand which tool can serve which purpose. And this, that's, you know, it's hard knowledge. It's a lot that you have to pick up over the years on, on the methods and the whole business of drug discovery. So if I have to say something, particularly about GAIN, is that we can very, very efficiently discover molecules that have a completely new molecular mechanism of action. And actually, we can do that so efficiently that we're happy to try with different systems with different proteins. And very early, we can decide if there's a biological response that can be therapeutically useful or not. Because the hard part in drug discovery, besides what Daesh was saying about how you finance your molecules, is actually knowing if your target is going to give you something useful for people, right? You can play with the protein, change how it behaves, And this actually can be good, it can be bad, or actually not have an effect. And that's what happens many times. That's why all the many, many clinical trials fail. But you need this initial molecule to actually know if you can do that. So we are really in a unique position to actually try to discover molecules very efficiently, then find out if they can give you this pharmacological effect we're looking for. That's the thing that I get more excited about. So basically efficient molecule discovery. Exactly. And this molecule can be the start of a drug discovery project. And it can also be just, you know, the answer maybe, uh, actually this, this looked like a fantastic target, but it's not. That could also happen. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges you have is focus because there are so many opportunities out there right now with your technology and you probably get introduced to many more with the people that come and contact you. Can you do this? Can you do that? And of course, as a scientist, sure, we can do that, right? But it's trying to stay focused with the resources that you have and shooting for that goal down the road, right? Exactly. And finding the right collaborators is essential because if we can get excited, you know, working with somebody else who's the world expert on disease X or target Y, Z, whatever, that's the best thing about drug discovery is the multidisciplinarity, working with colleagues with different areas and really, really enjoying learning from each other. Rich, and can I just add to Javier's, you know, as a Wall Street analyst who is covering gain, right? So What went into sort of our thinking, just very broadly speaking, when we looked at GAIN initially and we were sort of, the word is vetting them, you know, what we look for is that biotech drug development is very heavily regulated and drug development itself, there's a lot of publications around it. So meaning we have a lot of data and, you know, just like the law, we have a lot of prior art, so to speak, in the regulatory interactions that companies have with, you know, so we know what the pathways look like. So what we look for are companies that can speak that language, that are going down those regulatory pathways, but that they have discovered or come up with a new methodology to try to maybe speed up the interactions or come up with fine new drugs, et cetera. And that's really where gain check the boxes. So it's not that they're sort of revolutionizing, it's an evolution of approaches that are already happening. And so we were very assured by a lot of the sort of blocking and tackling that they're doing, you know, day to day, but at the same time, some of their you know, proprietary methodologies are what really excite us. And that's what we look for when we want to sort of you know, bring companies to our investors and to cover them. We've been speaking with Taj Singh, who's an equity research analyst. You just heard him on his buy recommendation for gain therapeutics. I think that's what that was. Was that Taj? And then also we had the chief scientific officer for gain therapeutics, Dr. Javier Barril. 
And I'm going to let you both do an open mic here as we close, because this is something we could talk forever on. But I think what we need to do is come back and revisit this to make sure that the analyst projections are on track, right? And the gain is staying on track six months from now or so. But open mic for both of you. Last remarks you'd like to make, Javier, on sort of what your future goals are for gain and what can we look forward to? I think we've covered most of it. I apologize if it was too verbose, actually, but I get really, you know, carried away sometimes. You're and, a scientist, though. We expect that of scientists. Yeah, and we enjoy that. Yeah, we enjoy the, our work. And as I said, continue with the project we have, take them forward into the next step. That's massive. That's going into human. Then the other aspect is leverage the technology and scale it to other projects and to do that in, in collaboration. I think that's what we're the most looking for. Great. I think Eric Richmond will be very happy with what you've said today. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> he better, right? Yeah. And that Taj, last remarks you'd like to make. Yeah, Rich. I mean, you know, you've heard our sort of buy thesis on gain. And, you know, again, listening to Javier just makes me that much more jazzed about them. We look for great science and management teams that are very passionate about what they're doing. And you can see that, I think, both things with Javier. You know, I'll just end with this, which is that more and more investors are getting interested in biotech, not just institutional investors, but, you know, non-institutional investors, whether they're referred to as retail or mom and pop or et cetera. It is really something fascinating. And what I would tell people is that because biotech is so heavily regulated, you know, it actually is sort of like a well-refereed game. You know, the referees are the regulators, the referees are science, clinical data, right? And if you're willing to spend some time and effort understanding those referees, the rule books of the game, then this is a game that actually can really create some great investment returns for you, the individual investor or the institutional investor. And that is why I'm so jazzed about biotech in the future, not just as an industry, but I think as an investment space, because it's an area that even regular people can come and by spending a little bit of time and understanding can create some investment returns for themselves. Well, you give me faith and confidence that biohealth innovation is in the right space and my career is safe for the next year or two here, Taj. So thank you very much. And, you know, this has been very interesting, but we're not done with both Taj and Javier because for the Biohealth Capital Region Forum, which is going to be on September 13th and 14th, two half days, is actually going to be virtual. We're going to pre-record, again, what we call BioBytes, which will be a small TED Talk. And Taj Singh from Oppenheimer is going to do one, and Javier Burrell from Gain Therapeutics is going to do one. So in the next couple of weeks, when that's scheduled, we'll see what progress has been made in the next two weeks. They'll get a chance to listen to this, see if there's anything else they'd like to embellish when they do their BioBite. So for all of those listeners who also be attending the seventh annual BioHealth Capital Region Forum, tune in again to hear both of these provocative speakers that we had on Biotech Podcast today. And we thank you all for listening. Taj, thanks for being on Biotalk. Javier, thank you for being on Biotalk. Can't wait to talk to you again in the near future. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much again for the invitation. And Taj, it's been great to share this space with you. Javier, thank you so very much. Real pleasure. And Rich, thank you for having me on. It was a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Biotalk with Rich Bendis. 